morning and welcome to UPN Focus. I'm your host, Milt Thompson, and again, we're going to review with you one of our very special organizations in our community that has the ability to help and service others. In fact, in the title of its name is Service, and that is the Executive Service Corps. And we've got their chairman of the board, Charlie Shoup. Welcome to UPN Focus. Thank you. And my friend, Amy Destalo, who's their executive director. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Amy, Thank you. tell us a little bit about the history of Executive Service Corps and what is it? Uh, actually, Milt, the, uh, the organization started about 27 years ago with, the, uh, with two very highly profiled community leaders uh, from uh, executive positions in Indianapolis. Uh, Jack Reich, who was then the chairman of AUL, well. mm -hmm. and uh, Fred Hadley, who was then an executive with uh, Eli Lilly. Mm -hmm. And it was built on the concept that after many, many years of, of creating um, successful careers and acquiring work ex expertise and experience, that there were a lot of retired uh, executives who really had much to give back to the community. So the, the, the concept was started and has now actually been replicated in about 40 cities across the country. So there are other... So we're the pioneer, right? Yes, here. we are. In 1974. 1974. And uh, what are some of its services and we, having services? We actually have two different focuses. Uh, it started originally as a consulting business, uh, so a consulting company for businesses. Over the last four or five years, uh, the focus has changed to be more in the nonprofit sector. So we have a, um, a full uh, array of services that we provide to help nonprofits to be more effectively run and operated. And then in addition to that, we counsel with IPS schools to provide uh, programs for youth, our youth development programs, almost exclusively operated in uh, the IPS school systems, occasionally some others, but, and we are changing that. It is growing outside of IPS. Charlie, in order to get to the top of the heap to be the chairman of the board of an organization of such successful and prestigious people, uh, that must mean that uh, uh, you have had such a successful career and have now donating your services as a volunteer board chair. What, uh, tell us about your background and what uh, led to the interest in Executive Services Corps and then your rise to the top. Well, many years ago I used to be a physical chemist, but then I ended up in the business world with the Union Carbide Corporation uh, in New York City. Uh, then Bell and Howell in Chicago, and uh, for quite a few years, Cabot Corporation, which is a Boston-based company. Uh, we moved to business here. I was director of corporate research at one time, later vice president, and uh, I was general manager of the business that we moved here in 1977. Uh, joined the organization, the ESC, about seven years ago. Became very much involved with the consulting, particularly for nonprofits. In fact, I was head of the nonprofit division for a while, then ultimately became chairman of the, our Management Assistance Program Steering Committee. And um, I have just been elected chairman. The board refused uh, to do a manual recount, so. <laughs> <laughs> there were no, no chads. <laughs> That's right, no chads. <laughs> and uh, so now as chairman of the board, and your responsibility as chairman of the board is to, to oversee uh, a board of uh, how many and what the various have, functions you have? We have a board of directors of 15, uh, an executive committee of six. We have several standing committees. Uh, the members of the Executive Service Corps are, or many of the members, are extremely active in the organization and, and uh, establishing policy and helping the staff do various, uh, carry out various tasks. And of course, we're all involved in some of the youth education programs, such as mentoring, uh, the pre preparation of job, uh, the putting on job preparation workshops, uh, helping to teach science and do science fair judging, and of course, our management consulting uh, efforts, which are primarily or, or largely toward nonprofit organizations now, but also to small, medium-sized businesses and, as Amy said, governments as well. Amy, what caused the change uh, in, in philosophical direction from that of essentially consulting services to businesses? What is it? Was it the private business uh, consultant sector that said, uh, maybe you better change what it is you do, or uh, the, the, uh, the, the cost, or the economy, or, or what has caused uh, a, a shift uh, from private business consulting, although I'm still uh, understand you do some of that, some of that. Uh, uh, to the nonprofit uh, sector? A couple of things happened. Uh, one of them is, is that over the last few years, there's been more and more responsibility that has been shifted to the nonprofit sector. Um, so the, the, the changes that are being taken, that are taking place in 
uh, the numbers of nonprofits, uh, the sheer numbers themselves, plus the competition for dollars and for volunteers has caused nonprofits to have to be more effectively run and operated. And part of this has come from the from the uh, from funders, which there's so many you know, so many hands out now that they have to create some standards of of effectiveness. So that's one of the changes that that has happened. And the other one is is that we have a number of foundations locally that help us to subsidize our ability to provide those services. Um, the uh, Central Indiana Community Foundation, uh, both the Indianapolis Foundation and the Legacy Fund in that group, plus the Health Foundation, the Hoover Foundation, the Clues Fund, there's a number of foundations locally that realize the, we are, we're almost partners with these foundations and helping them to make sure that their clients are running effectively. Your background, operating. your background, Amy, and we, we go way back, mm -hmm. and um, you were, were snatched uh, away <laughs> and, and, and brought into our community, um, uh, uh, primarily in the nonprofit sector. Um, uh, why don't you, is it, give me a trace of that had, career yes, and, and, and kind of what had, led you to this particular opportunity. I've had about 20 years of, of nonprofit management in three different parts of the country. Started with Junior Achievement of Chattanooga. Uh, was there for about five years, then I went to Northern California for about six years, and then worked here locally with Junior Achievement. So I have a, I have a um, almost 20 years of experience in nonprofit management. And then in addition to that, I had a couple of years of an interesting um, uh, experience with a, with a small computer consulting company which I think really sort of paved the way for me to, to play a role with Executive Service Corps, having both the nonprofit management and the consulting business background for a couple of years. So you, you brought those skills of, of, of not only management, but also of some business relative to direct service, but much more so looking at nonprofits uh, as you are exactly. one yourself, but in terms of how you become a catalyst uh, for the instruction and, and service to these various program exactly. components. Now, uh, those program components uh, um, and that uh, uh, you're really responsible for, other than the, you mentioned the, the youth services? Uh, as the CEO of the organization, I'm, I'm responsible for the total operation, both the youth education side and our consulting practice. And the Executive Service Corps has direct service uh, to how many nonprofits uh, in our community? Oh, each year we have probably 150 different projects. Um, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, what about 150 different consulting, uh, I mean, uh, nonprofits that we work with on an annual basis. Now, some of those consultancies go from year to year, and actually there are uh, agencies in which we're doing multiple, we're, we're having multiple types of impacts. We are in the process, or developing it and continuing to develop what we consider to be best practices in nonprofit consulting. And we're finding that there's not any other single organization that is stepping up to the plate with this. We do have some expertises in certain areas of nonprofit management, like uh, fundraising, board development, some of those areas, but the broad spectrum of what it takes to be effectively run as a nonprofit is not something that any other organization except Executive Service Corps is doing. So it has really given us a, a mission, a commitment to provide that service and to continue to expand the offerings that we have currently to stay abreast of what is the latest and greatest, the best practices. In, in managing nonprofits. Best practices and management of nonprofits, yes. Executive Service Corps will want to get into detail about some of those practices right after these important words. And welcome back to UPN Focus. We've been talking with Charlie Shoup and Amy Vassallo about Executive Service Corps uh, and their consulting services, uh, essentially of a uh, battalion of retired executives that bring uh, significant uh, skills that they've uh, gained uh, throughout their careers uh, now into consulting services uh, for business, but the larger the nonprofit community, as well as for mentoring, as well as and, and some youth services. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm trying to best summarize if we can before we talk about some of the detail uh, and, and 
before we left after, after the break, uh, you were talking about uh, establishing best practices and that you really are the only organization out there that uh, can consi consistently um, uh, develop uh, templates, if you will, for these nonprofits uh, to be able to develop outcomes um, so that they can demonstrate to their funders the uh, uh, degree to which they are successful. Is that pretty good? That is good. <laughs> well done. Charlie, how do you do that? I mean, uh, how, do, you, do you go and make an assessment? Uh, does a nonprofit uh, call your organization and say, we need help, or uh, do you solicit from them? Um, yes. <laughs> all, all, the all the above. All of the above. I'd like to know a lot more about that. I think I saw my name on the side of your letterhead there. I want to be, <laughs> right. be sure what all that all that means. T tell us about how how uh, someone would would access the services of the Executive Service Corps. Just Court. a simple telephone call to five seven four seven two seven two, and uh, we could get going and get start get started on a needs assessment. Uh, we have one of our executives, uh, an experienced uh, uh, a member, would call on the potential client, find out what that client really needs. Uh, explain what we can do and decide to see whether or not there's a fit. And as I mentioned during the break, uh, I've been absolutely amazed at the number of nonprofit organizations in particular that exist in this, uh, in this area. There's been a proliferation of non yes. nonprofits. Um, uh, a, I think because of a significant uh, growing community need, and yes. then there's kind of a change in the way um, uh, government and tax dollars are being deployed relative to ultimate services. Right. And if we don't have a uh, well-crafted but efficiently operated nonprofit community, um, there will be a lot of people uh, kind of left out uh, of the, the good spoils uh, of, uh, of, our, of our community's uh, economic structure. Uh, uh, because of that, nonprofits have kind of stepped in to take a place, uh, yet at the same time, most nonprofits are run by lean staffs. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, their lifeblood, uh, other than their, their funding resources, are volunteers. Tell us about the Executive Service Corps volunteer uh, group, uh, who, they are, who they are, what's the perfect profile of one of them, what kind of skills would they possess, are there any training necessary for them uh, in order to be in position to help and train others. Uh, being successful in business may not translate into being able to do needs assessments and or uh, giving advice uh, on how one would get outcomes. That's exactly right. We have quite a bit of internal training workshops for our members in various areas, such as uh, agency assessments. Uh, facilitating the development of strategic plans, and we're getting uh, an increasing number of calls for that activity. As more and more nonprofits realize they need to act and operate more like businesses in a more business-like way, and so we are re we're visiting old strategic plans that have perhaps been put on the shelf. Uh, we're working with uh, organizations to create brand new or revised strategic plans, and then helping them learn how to translate the strategic plan into action plans, and then follow up on those action plans to be sure that what they're doing is meeting the needs, and going in the direction that the strategic plan calls for. How do you market your services, Amy? Uh, a lot of it is um, repeat business. We also have referrals from, uh, from foundations, uh, from commu the community. One of the things that we're attempting to do, and we are told that we're one of the best kept secrets in Indianapolis, is to reverse that uh, through some, uh, beginning some direct mail campaign to just to create an awareness of the types of services that we have, both in our educational arena and in our, in our consulting practice. Our consulting business really takes on two different approaches. One of them is an established set of methodologies that we have developed, and as Charlie mentioned, we train our consultants in how to deliver those. Uh, that, that would include uh, strategic planning, uh, agency assessment, uh, bylaws review, board development, several different areas there. And then we have such a vast uh, ec base of expertise within our membership that we're also able to tailor our approach in specific areas like human resource uh, needs, financial assessment, uh, including um, uh, automating uh, your financial operations. Uh, we have um, facilities management, energy energy management, lots of different areas that nonprofits need can be tailored to specifically the needs of that nonprofit. So I have seldom had, uh, because of the breadth of knowledge of our, of our volunteers, have we, seldom do we ever have a request that we're not able to comply with. Now it does happen some, and we may have, for instance, marketing is one of our, our most frequently asked for areas. There may be a wait sometimes because we've got so many of a specific uh, expertise need, but 
by and large, there's not much that we can't help in assisting. Well, you, our, our shared experiences uh, mm -hmm. uh, in this community with the non uh, a profit uh, a sector, um, you, you recognize that uh, they are operated kind of on a mean and a lean kind of a basis. And you were uh, uh, mentioning kind of best practices in terms of uh, how it is they are to develop uh, kind of outcomes. Uh, wh wh what is it? What, is, what are the guts of it that to, to allow them to kind of let go, if you will, of uh, perhaps their past practices to allow themselves uh, to be consultants when they're so busy? Uh, my phrase, uh, painting that moving bus, um, uh, that, that uh, they don't have time to think about strategic planning because they're really trying to see how they keep the light bulbs on or how the rent paid or how they can deliver direct services. Uh, uh, so how, how do you remove that barrier for the access? I think you've, uh, you've, you've put your, your key on one of our biggest challenges. Uh, and for many, many years our services were totally free. Uh, and we, were, we did our, our normal fundraising to provide those services. We now have our clients to make some sort of monetary commitment. It may not be very much, but it does sort of align them with the focus of what we're trying to accomplish. But keeping, keeping uh, and, and I talk to for-profit consultants as well, and keeping people on track is really the hardest because as you say, they're putting out fires on a day-to-day -day basis. They have so many operational needs, wearing so many different hats, that it's very difficult to do that. Sometimes they come with so much pain. Initially, that phone call, there is pain that they have that they want that they want some help with. Either a funder has turned them down and they need some help in a particular area. They may have a very, uh, you know, a, a very stressful human resource issue that they need some professional help with. And then once we help them with that and we can create the bond and the trust and they realize that we really want to partner with them to help them be successful. That's how the relationships began to grow. And there's some real love stories out there. I mean, there's some great examples of relationships that have gone on for years with consultants mm -hmm. and with agencies who just continue to work together um, for, you know, for many years and as, as issues come up. We've had some agencies, for example, ask some of the consultants sometimes mm -hmm. to go on their board on a continuing yes. basis long after mm -hmm. the consulting project has ended. Uh, you, you mentioned that sometimes there are very challenging areas where people are in pain, and you mentioned marketing specifically. But is, is there some peculiar theme that kind of runs through the, the breadth of, uh, of the nonprofit community um, that uh, they're most challenged by, whereby you try to fill in that gap for them? Um, strategic planning is one of them. So planning is always an issue. Fundraising is always an issue and staffing and board development, those, you know, the human sides of those, I think are probably the, the ones that come to us most frequently that we're able to provide assistance to. Um, I would say those are, our most are the most frequent areas. So how, how much uh, uh, time do you, do you dedicate to uh, uh, training this volunteer um, um, staff of consultants that are out there uh, that may have some uh, uh, concern about their own abilities to actually work in nonprofit communities when perhaps many of them have never spent very much time doing that, perhaps other than on a board of directors and not in a staff. So I, I, I would assume that a significant amount of your time and effort uh, is devoted towards that. Uh, and I'm interested not only hearing the answer to that, but also um, how um, um, people out there who might be looking for uh, wonderful volunteer opportunities and may have that kind of expertise might avail themselves of that kind of training, what might remove that stream of skepticism from them so that they make that call. And I'll want to get those answers right after these important words. <laughs> Welcome back to UPN Focus. We've been having an intriguing conversation about uh, Executive Service Corps uh, because it is probably an organization like no other in our community in that it uh, actually goes, uh, 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 recruits volunteers, trains them on how to go help other staffs and volunteers, primarily of nonprofits. Um, uh, tell us about that recruitment process and that training process and uh, if you can, leave a moment or two to talk about your youth services program since we didn't quite get enough, I don't think, energy behind that, Amy. Okay. Um, our recruitment process is uh, it's always, um, it, it's always a challenge and, and, and something that we have to continue to, to focus on because the core of people who make up our, our, this extraordinary group of people are really the asset that we provide to the, 
to the community. So we do have a, a recruiting campaign on an annual basis and identify what I call people who like to work. So even though they're entering retirement, they're not ready to stop working. So we provide this, an outlet for them, these executives and, and former professionals, who, to continue providing service to the community and utilizing the skills that they've developed over a lifetime. Uh, the de you asked about the demographics a bit. We're finding that many are leaving the workforce much earlier. Earlier, finding a younger much group earlier. of volunteers who may not have even thought of this kind of service. And I think as we move into the baby boomer retiree generation, we're going to find more of that. Uh, but we probably have a demographic of the average age being about 65. Uh, we, we do try to utilize our volunteers as quickly as possible from the time that they leave the workforce, whether it's in our youth education programs or in our management assistance programs, because it is at, at a time when they are, their skills are most um, um, current to be able to, to translate into providing support and counseling to students and to, um, and to our nonprofit clients. The trainings that we provide are, are pretty extensive and we have uh, expert, experts within our membership that deliver these programs throughout the year, and not only, them. and develop them. They develop them and deliver them throughout the year. Both new members go through a training program. You mentioned the, uh, the nonprofit governance is one of the things that that we stress is helping them to understand better how to take their business skills and translate to the nonprofit sector. So we've got a, a large group of volunteers out there who are willing and able, now that they know about Executive Service Corps, that they're going to come recruit, they can get trained on the things that they don't have skills on. You're going to get them deployed, not only out there for uh, pr private business consulting, but for nonprofit consulting, and also use services. Yes. And people will take advantage and access of this Executive Service Corps, just like they will this week's community calendar. Here are some more events in our area for you to focus on. The Indiana Extension Homemakers Association, in partnership with the Cooperative Extension Service and Purdue University, is offering 12 $500 scholarships to qualified candidates. If you're 25 or older and want to complete your education or upgrade your vocational skills, call the Grant County Cooperative Extension Office for more information. If you're a runner and plan to participate in this year's mini-marathon, the Southport Presbyterian Church is hosting an open training group. Runners of all levels of experience are invited to train each Tuesday at 5.15 and Saturday at 7 a.m. The Central Indiana Broadcasters Job Fair will be held Saturday, February 3rd from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Sheraton Indianapolis North Hotel. The job fair is free and will feature a panel of broadcast professionals to answer your questions. Don't miss this chance to learn more about your career in broadcasting. We want to hear from you. Send your event information three weeks in advance to be part of the UPN 23 community calendar. And of course, I know you'll take advantage of those wonderful opportunities to participate in our community activities, just as you will with our Executive Service Corps, which is ably led by Charlie Shute and Amy DeSalo. Thank you for visiting our show this week. And you come right back here this time next week for UPN Focus.